Britain's a small island with an extraordinary past and amazing landscapes. But what we see above ground is only half the story. I'm traveling the length and breadth of our country to see it from a whole new perspective, underground. I'm Rob Bell, and I'm on a subterranean mission. I'm exploring the mysteries and wonders that lie right under our feet. You've got to make yourself as small as possible. From man-made to natural wonders. There's just so much to take in here. Many are forgotten corners from the darkest points in history. There's a real presence down here. This is an adventure of those places beneath the surface, a journey through underground Britain. This time, my journey takes me to southern England. I'll be exploring a top secret installation designed to save the nation. 35 days without becoming contaminated. I'll descend into perilous tunnels dug out in search of precious metal. This is what they came down here for. <sighs> and I'll uncover a subterranean labyrinth with a mystical past. The ghost of a druid with a sickle dripping with human blood. <laughs> I begin my underground adventure in South Devon's Torquay a picturesque seaside town that's been a popular holiday destination since Victorian times. But I'm here to uncover a much older story, on the trail of some of Britain's very first humans. Archaeological investigations have revealed that people didn't start visiting just a few hundred years ago. Torquay's been a stopover for the last half a million years and the choice of prehistoric accommodation? A cave. I'm on my way to a remarkable one to find out how this quiet corner of Britain turned the idea of where we come from on its head. It's called Kent's Cavern, and what was discovered here rewrote the history books. I don't know about you, but when I think of caves, I think of coastal cliffs or hidden away up in the mountains, somewhere remote. I certainly don't think of a built-up urban environment, but the entrance to Kent's Cavern is just in here. Here we go. Stepping beyond this, I'm having my own little Narnia moment here. Just a few steps and you're straight in. Look at this. It sounds different, it feels different, it's much cooler in here. It's enormous. Kent's Cavern was created around two million years ago by water carving its way through the limestone. Some of the formations feel really alien. But the colours are really deep and rich and earthy. Two hundred years ago, people were starting to question the story of life on Earth. Believing that Kent's Cavern's ancient rock may hold clues, early antiquarian explorers decided to excavate it. Back then, the cave looked very different to what we see today. We're walking at a level that's not the original floor. The original floor that was here in 1865, before the Victorians started excavating, was much higher. So the floor would have been way up there, way above my head. Probably twice as high as where we're standing right now. This was completely infilled with mud and rocks and boulders. About 8,000 tonnes of rubble that was taken out. Amongst the rubble, the Victorian excavators found the bones of animals that had long since disappeared from Britain. We found evidence of mammoth. Lots of mammoth teeth found in here. Sabre-toothed tiger. 
If you know where to look, you can even see ancient bones still embedded in the cave roof. Here's a bear, the skull of a cave bear that, uh, that lived here some 320,000 years ago. In Torquay, yeah. you had bears, bears roaming around and dwelling in caves. So it died probably in hibernation. The bears were hibernating in these caves here in Torquay. The creatures came here during cold periods in the Ice Ages, when temperatures and sea levels were much lower, and Britain was connected to Europe by a vast land bridge across what's now the North Sea and English Channel. Outside looked completely different. Summer temperatures, 12 degrees maybe maximum. So these mammoths are just kind of trundling across the North Sea, trundling across the Channel, coming here and then trundling back again. And that's, and that's how we've got this incredible evidence of, of these Ice Age animals. I'm struggling to imagine prehistoric animals roaming past the spot where Torquay's B&Bs stand today. But the evidence is all here, in the town's museum. This is impressive. This is all been excavated from Ken's cavern. Deer bones, hyena. Lots of hyena from the cave. Rhino, even. Lots of rhino as well. Oh, mammoth teeth. These are mammoth milk teeth. They're in amazing condition, aren't they? They're beautifully preserved, yeah. Obviously, mammoths weren't actually living in the cave. They're too big an animal, so these things have been dragged in by hyenas. The most extensive Victorian excavation of Kent's cavern was led by a dedicated explorer, William Pengelly, who excavated over 80,000 finds from the cave and meticulously numbered each one. Here we have a box of bear bones. We can see on here that it's got a number, and that's a Pengelly number. Oh, yeah, just in here? Yeah. Was can you read it? 6626? Six, and that's Pengeli's original numbering on that. That's as well. Pengeli's handwriting. He he actually wrote on every bone himself. This is one of Pengeli's original diaries. This is six six two six, and it says uh, he's excavating on Thursday, 29th of July in 1875. Two teeth of bear bones and pieces of bones, and we now know that those finds will be around about half a million years old. So that's a piece of half a million year old bear. But what the archaeologists discovered next changed the history of man and shocked Victorians to the core. I'm burrowing through southern England. Deep under Devon, I'm in Kent's Cavern, an extraordinary cave system where Ice Age beasts once sheltered. But findings uncovered by Victorian archaeologists suggest they weren't the only residents. There were early humans, too. Some of the oldest evidence of human activity uh, in Britain were found underneath this floor. Flint hand axes. It's clearly been formed into some kind of working tool. And you could have used it as a hammer action. OK. Possibly sort of a scraping. It may not look much, but rocks like this, shaped by a human hand in the prehistoric past, were world-changing. Most early Victorians believed the Earth and man was, as the Bible stated, created by God only around 6,000 years ago. But the Victorian archaeologist who did the main excavation in these caves, William Pengelly, estimated that these rock formations took tens of thousands of years to be created by nature and the axes were found underneath them. So the tools had to be even older than the rocks above. To suggest that man was older than 6,000 years old was something that uh, for, for, the, for the Victorian society was hugely controversial. In fact, it was so controversial that the, the discoveries at Kent's Cavern were banned from any discussion. Because at the time, it was accepted that man had come as the Bible mm -hmm. states. Yes. So something that contradicted that so, so violently almost, must have been almost impossible to, for, for societies to accept. 
To think that they'd actually live with prehistoric animals was unthinkable. Modern dating techniques show that the tool is around half a million years old, which means its maker was a member of a very early human species, Homo heidelbergensis. Another discovery, this time of an actual human bone, proves that another later species of human used this cave. It doesn't look like much, does it? <laughs> a few teeth uh, in a piece of bone. And this uh, is, is, uh, is actually the, uh, the oldest human fossil ever found in Britain. This is a replica of the 41,000-year-old human jaw. Its owner was an early Homo sapiens. It's from early modern humans, so from people that thought and felt and had the same feelings as us. But our ancestors lived in a very different world. What it might be is that that person died in or near the cave and then would, was dragged into the cave by hyenas who then ate the body, leaving the hardest part, which is this piece of the jaw. Oh, that's grisly. Another find dating back 10,000 years suggests humans actually lived here. Archaeologists have discovered some of the very first purpose-made lighting. They found empty scallop shells that had traces of burning on them, and it's thought that they were filled with a mixture of dry moss and animal fats. Now these could burn for around an hour and light up the cave. It's really, really effective. It's incredible to be in this cave thousands of years later and see the world as our ancient ancestors would have known it. Leaving the ice ages far behind, I'm traveling southwest to a secret underground installation. It's a glimpse into one of the darkest chapters of recent history. But looking down on South Devon's picturesque coastline, it's hard to imagine anything sinister down there. The location, I'm told, is just a mile inland, where during World War II there was a major airstrip. RAF Bolthead played a small but vital role in winning the war 70 years ago. Even so, what's that got to do with underground Britain? Well, it's what happened next with that building right down there that I'm interested in. It's called Bolthead Bunker. And when it was built, it was one of the most hush-hush locations in the country. The building holds the secret to our government's defense plans against nuclear war. Nuclear explosions are caused by weapons such as H-bombs or atom bombs. They are like ordinary explosions, only many times more powerful. They cause great heat and blast, so severe that it can kill. They also make a cloud of deadly dust, which falls slowly to the ground. This is what is called fallout. Shortly after World War II, the Soviet Union and America were threatening each other with nuclear missiles. As an ally of America, the UK was a target. Stepping back 40 years, this public information film was designed to keep the general public above ground calm. <laughs> but the moment the government feared a nuclear missile was on its way, they planned to move underground. This is sterile. If World War III broke out, the country would be divided into regional seats of government, and Bolthead Bunker would be Region 7's secret headquarters. It takes you right back to that Cold War era. But how could the top brass in Bolthead Bunker govern a population of around five million people living in an area stretching from Gloucestershire to Cornwall? All the local councillors, local technicians, all the emergency services, they would all congregate here to effectively control and look after the whole of the southwest. Wow. It's quite it's a massive area, isn't it? It is, yes. 
So how many people do you think would have been down here had, had there been nuclear fallout and, and that, that, that it warning It was estimated there could have been between two and 300 personnel here. And they would have been shut in here for that, that whole period to try and get this part of the country, Region 7, back up and running again? Yes, while there was an emergency situation, they'd be shut down within this bunker. If the Soviet Union had hit the red button, I can only imagine what it'd been like above ground. Mass destruction and mayhem. The job of the people in this bunker was to try to keep some sort of order amongst the chaos. These rooms here all formed the communications hub down here. You've got the telephone exchange in there, 400 lines coming in and out. This would have been full of teleprinters. Again, messages coming in and out. For the duration of the Cold War, this bunker's 28 rooms were kept in pristine working order, ready to become Region 7's headquarters. All staff, including 88-year-old Tom Geeches, were sworn to secrecy. <laughs> so, Tom, what's it like being back down here in Bolthead? Well, it's amazing, really, when you, when you think about it. I mean, I, I spent a third, a third of my life here. Did you really? How many years? 29. So what was your job down here? Watchmen, we were called. There were three of us. You had to look after the place, keep it clean, keep it uh, tidy. So between the three of you, yeah. there'd be somebody here 24-7? 24, 24 hours a day, it's, uh, yeah, seven days a week. So this, so this place then was watched and maintained and looked after 24 hours a day, just in case... Just in case somebody dropped the bomb. Tom regularly signed in the nation's top military officials to Bolthead Bunker. The army used to come here, the army and the Air Force, and the Navy come once or twice, and they had exercises here with, with all the machinery downstairs. We weren't allowed to go in and see them or nothing. So even that was secret to you? Yeah, you know, oh yeah, yeah, we, we weren't allowed in when the, when the troops were here. It seems the government did at least have a Cold War plan in place. But if a nuclear missile hit, would Bolthead Bunker be up to the job? It's pretty obvious this is built for <laughs> protection. I mean, this looks pretty solid. And st how, how thick's this concrete? Yeah. They're approximately a metre thick. Of pure concrete? Yes. Oh, really? Heavily reinforced with steel. What yeah. about the roof? Because that seems... Same, yep. Almost a metre thick, reinforced with steel. And then finally underneath as well? Same again. So we really are in a, in a concrete, one metre thick concrete box. Absolutely. Down yeah. here. But if the air above ground was contaminated with radiation and fallout, how would those down here breathe in clean air? We're actually in what is effectively a massive air duct. The air's been drawn in through here. From outside? From outside, and then in through these gills. It also goes into the main fan, just down below. Let's have a look. To me, it looks like any modern air conditioning system. But would it be able to shut out contaminated air? What would happen if there had been nuclear fallout? The gills would be shut tight, this door would be shut tight, and then the air is then diverted through these filters here, and they'll take out the polluted air before it goes into the main system. I'm not convinced the 1950s-style cooker hood technology would have been up to the job. And I reckon there's another weak point. Surely the doors here would have been a bit of a weakness. You can see the rubber seals on these doors, and the idea was that the door closed. That formed a seal, which is supposed to be airtight. This? That's yep. it? Yep. There's That's one it. in here as well, isn't there? Yep. Ugh, it's heavy. And that just and that's it. Yeah. That is the only protection against air coming in. This yeah. is 1950s technology. Early technology. I yeah. love how we're calling this rubber seal technology. Yeah. <laughs> Sealed inside the building, a complex system of generators was designed to keep the power switched on. But for how long? 
35 days in the hope that the radiation levels had depleted enough to be able to go back outside and do anything you needed to do without becoming contaminated. Two generators running 24 hours a day. That's your electricity, your heating. Air conditioning, air, air ventilation, conditioning. everything. Importantly. Yep. Your life depends on those generators. Because if the generators stop, the air conditioning stops, the lights go. And you can imagine being in here with no lights, no air. Uh, it's quite a nightmare scenario. So actually, the plans to survive here were as good as they could come up with, but they were hardly foolproof. No, there was a lot of hope. If the country's military radar stations detected a missile heading our way, the nation would have had just four minutes to take cover. Had there been the four minute warning, would you have been down inside this bunker as well? Well, I think if the truth was known, if anything had, had been going on, a lot of the higher ups would have been in here, and I think it was going to kick us three watchmen out. Do you think so? I'm pretty sure they were. <laughs> for nearly 30 years, Bolthead Bunker was kept ready for action. It wasn't until 1994, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Region 7's secret headquarters were finally closed. The next stage of my journey under southern England takes me east to the Roman times and beyond. I'm heading to an enigmatic warren of tunnels beneath Chislehurst. Above ground, Chislehurst is a leafy commuter town popular with London city workers. But scratch beneath the surface, you'll find a whole different world, underground. These are Chislehurst Caves a dark, mysterious maze of man-made tunnels. Local legend says they're 8,000 years old, and there are tales of miners, smugglers, and even human sacrifice. So I want to sort out the facts from the fiction and find out just what has been the enduring pull of this underground labyrinth. These caves stretch on and on for a staggering 22 miles. I and mean, just listen to that echo. Here we go. The Victorians opened a section of Chislehurst Caves to the paying public in 1900. Visitors flocked to hear elaborate tales of the cave's dark past. These were reinforced by early archaeologists who were eager to connect the creation of the tunnels to some lurid historic stories. Now, I think I'm um, at this place right here. At least I think I am. This is the Druid section. There's also an Anglo-Saxon section and a Roman section. But they all look pretty similar to me. Jason, my first question is, how have these caves come about being here? Technically, they're mines. They're only caves because we're underground. And the stuff the miners were after was chalk. It's claimed the mines go back nearly 2,000 years to Roman Britain. So what were they after all this chalk for? Well, they would have dug it out, nice and soft, pulled it up top, and then they would have burnt it in kilns or kiln pits to make lime. And they would have used that lime and the plaster, the mortar, the cement to build all their bathhouses, their walls, the lovely villas that they lived in. In fact, the road going into London, that old Roman road, this is the chalk that would have been used to create those things. But it wasn't just sweat and toil that brought people down here. It's rumoured these caves were used as a place of ancient worship and human sacrifice.
My underground expedition through southern England has brought me to Chislehurst Caves. This man-made labyrinth has attracted stories of magic and mysticism. My mission is to sort the fact from the fiction. It really is an absolute maze down here. Every few metres there's a tunnel heading off in one direction or another. It's been said these caves were once home to the ancient Druids. History books tell us very little about these mysterious Iron Age priests. But people have suggested they performed pagan rituals here in Chislehurst Caves. There's plenty of evidence that prehistoric people found caves religious. Uh, they deposited offerings in them uh, all the way from the Old Stone Age right down to Roman times. The Romans told stories of Druids performing spiritual ceremonies and human sacrifice. Nearly 2,000 years later, Victorians picked up on these stories and elaborated them with blood-dripping detail. The idea of the Druids as experts in human sacrifice is quite big in Victorian times as a kind of horror picture of ancient paganism to justify being civilised, Christian and Victorian. Local legend has it that this ledge carved out of the chalk is an altar used by Druids for ritual slaughter. Do we think this could be Druid? It could be a Druid altar, but the odds against are less than one in a million. We haven't found a single Druid altar in the whole of Europe. But the first visitors to come down here lapped it up. It was this brouhaha about Druid altars that began bringing people down here in large numbers. But it actually started the tourist industry for uh, Chislehurst Caves. But hey, it just could be possible, but right behind you now in these shadows is the ghost of a druid with a sickle dripping with human blood. <laughs> OK, back to reality. Something we do know is true is that these tunnels were full of chalk. And where you get chalk, you get this stuff. Flint. Flint naturally occurs as nodules in chalk beds. Most people know it was used to make Stone Age tools and weapons. But flints were still being used to win battles only 200 years ago. Whoa! <laughs> That's got a heck of a fire to it, Mark. Mark's using just the type of rifle with a flintlock firing mechanism which helped defeat the French at the Battle of Waterloo. The flint will fire forward, yeah. striking the frizzen. It creates a spark to ignite the charge inside the barrel, and then you get the discharge. So a rifle like this needed a totally trusty flint in battle. Well, I like using the darker flint. For me, it's a bit more reliable. So when I get given my flint from the sergeant, I'll try and get the nice, nice dark ones. The flint found in Chislehurst Caves is dark, good quality flint, perfect for use against Napoleon's army at Waterloo. Is there any chance I could have a go? Yep. No really? No problem. <laughs> but the cave's association with war doesn't end in Napoleonic times. During the First World War, they were used as an ammunition depot. And in World War II, Chislehurst Caves became an air raid shelter. During the Blitz, 15,000 people took cover down here. Chislehurst Caves notice. Were these all rules for 17 rules? The rules covered everything from safety to lights out times. Stones from all kinds are prohibited. There must be reasonable quiet by 10 p.m. I mean, look at this, no furniture admitted. They needed the room for the people. What was the setup then? Would people just come down here for the nights when there was a bombing going on? Some people would. Yeah. You know, just for the evening, the air raid siren went off, they'd come down. Yeah. But others chose to live here permanently. They were fearful. The bombs were going to fall, destroy the houses. Those that lost their homes had nowhere to go. But it wasn't free. They paid sixpence a week for a plot. 
The entrance fee helped pay for power, sanitation and ventilation. It was vital to keep the air moving as the heat from 15,000 people raised the temperature down here from a constant 10.5 degrees Celsius right up to 28 degrees. It was dubbed the underground city. It gave them a sense of leaving something devastating up top and coming into a world where they could say, everything's fine. You had your lights, you had all the facilities you could need. You had a cinema, you had a theater, dance halls, you had canteens. The church, people did die. So services could have been performed in the church for them. What, also, what funeral services? Yeah. You had weddings. It's a church, it's consecrated, where else? I mean, they weren't gonna go up top and take the chance on anything up there. They felt fully comfortable down here. And you had the hospital, the only child actually born in the cave, Cavina, was given this spectacular name because she was born inside of the cave hospital due to back-to-back -to -back air raids going on up top. Today, the caves are uninhabited. Only visitors and guides walk these tunnels that echo with real history and tall tales. I can see why this winding labyrinth still tempts people to believe in the dark past of Chislehurst. Leaving the mysteries of the caves far behind, I'm heading way out west again to explore underground tunnels dug into the cliffs of Cornwall. My destination, Pendeen. On Cornwall's western tip, much of the land is barren and windswept. The Atlantic Ocean menacing. But this coastline is also littered with the remnants of an industry that's key to Cornwall's heritage. Below these abandoned chimneys, people have gone to amazing lengths to dig out one of the Earth's most valuable rocks. People have mined this coast for thousands of years. I'm in an 85-mile system of tunnels that makes up Cornwall's Giva Mine, dug out to produce over 50,000 tonnes of valuable metal. You can still spot it glimmering in the rock. They are drilling and blasting a very, very narrow seam. And that's it here, up in the roof. Uh -huh. To the untrained eye, it's hard to see, but Mike's pointing out a seam containing tin. A really narrow tin load, and you can see it right here. It stands out, it goes up above our heads, and it goes down below the feet. Tin has been used throughout history to make everything from bronze weapons to the humble baked bean can. It's a metal that changed the world. And you can see it's pretty narrow. It is pretty narrow, but the whole tunnel's pretty narrow as well. That's correct. Anything outside of that vein is complete waste. So in effect, the guy is mined to shoulder width. As long as they could turn around inside the tunnel, that was wide enough for them, because the more waste you mined, the more rubbish you had to carry out of the mine. It's almost kind of surgical precision mining through all this bedrock. Which explains the size of the tunnels. It does indeed. <laughs> all of this has been brought up from inside the mine. This is the fruit of the miner's labour, tin ore. I mean, it just looks like any other normal rock to me. But to the miners, this is where the profits were. In the early 19th century, the next door Levant mine found a way of making tin mining big business. Oh, look at this. This is fantastic, isn't it? All right, tell me about this. What have we got so here? What is it? This is the winding engine for Levant mine. Used to raise the ore up from deep underground up to the surface 24 hours a day. And it's what, steam driven, is it? Oh, steam driven, yes. It's a beautiful machine. Does it still work today? It does. Do you want to sit going? Can we? I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. We'll get it fired up. Whoa. Straight away. It's really responsive, isn't it? 
This is beautiful. It's mechanics in motion. It's pure mechanics. Look at the piston up and down. So you've got the flywheel turning here, and then that's driving, what, that's driving big spools? It's driving the, the, what's called the winding drum, but yeah, just like spools on the outside of here, and two cables running from here over a headgear about 50 metres away over here. Basically, one skip bucket being lowered down the shaft, empty, at the same time the full one's coming up, and then you see this dial up on the wall up here would show the driver where the two skips were in the shaft. So when it gets near to the, the top and to the bottom, he's then slowing everything down and actually relying on bell signals from the men at those levels to tell him, slow, 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 stop. I guess you'd have to know where they were because if, if that full bucket got to the top full of ore, crashed straight through the headgear at the top. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Disaster. Not very good, yeah. Might lose your job. So this is really, really important in the whole function of the mining. It is, very important, yeah. It was one of the fastest ones in its day. It, it winched it up at around about 130 metres a minute. Um, so to, you're talking about four and a half minutes to do the complete lift from bottom to top. And this is with a, a tonne, a quarter tonne and a half of ore in, in the skip. When they introduced steam engines to this mine, to Levant mine, um, in the sort of late 1820s, they probably quadrupled their production. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Straight yeah, away? Yeah, yeah. And the technological advances didn't stop there. In the early 1900s, a new invention sped up the process of extracting the tin from the ore. In Giva Mill, the ore was crushed, ground into small particles, and then transferred onto huge shaking tables. This is what's been mined out and ground down. Correct. Nothing else has been added, nothing else. So I'll just spread that along there. Spread it along there. OK, and let the table do its work. There's a slope on the table. OK, yeah. There's a flow of water over the table, and there's this movement. Everything is moving along in this direction, because that's the movement of the table. Oh, yeah, here you go, yeah. So the sands is just, just making its way slowly with every little shudder. It's just... Ju -ju -ju -ju. There's the darker, denser material staying at the head of the table. Yeah. And the waste material goes off in that direction there. Yeah, it's just yeah. That, that's just that's just washed that's off there. Just washed off there. The stuff that we're actually looking for, the tin, is staying at the head of the table. The force of gravity separated the heavier tin crystals from the lighter rock surrounding it. And that works its way along, falls off the table, and there we have it. That is your tin. This is tin here. That's tin oxide in there. Less than 1% of what came up from underground ended up as being that. So what it means is that stuff there has to pay for all of the costs of mining it, all of the costs of processing it, all the other costs of the mine. Plus profit. And also make a profit. <clears throat> For most of the 20th century, the Giva mine sold its tin worldwide and made a profit of over seven million pounds. But chasing profits cost lives. I'm going to experience the extreme risks the miners had to take in their quest for tin. I'm on the final stage of my journey under southern Britain. Throughout history, men have taken enormous risks to extract the valuable metal tin from this Cornish coastline. I'm on my way. OK. Following in their trail, I'm heading to the Levant mine. It opened in 1830, and its entrance, I'm told, sits precariously on the cliffside, hundreds of feet down there. I've got a safety harness, which is more than could be said for back then. Put one foot wrong, and the miners would tumble head first into the Atlantic. Oh. This is it here. Entrance to the mine. 
So that's some effort just to get down here. But here's the seam. This is what they came down here for. So they followed this in a good couple of hundred metres into this cliff face. They tunnelled down and down. And then they weren't even done. They tunnelled back out in the other direction, underneath the seabed. The Levant tin miners burrowed an extraordinary two and a half kilometres out to sea. Toiling less than 40 feet under the ocean floor, the men knew that one false stroke could be their last. Now that was hard enough just getting down here. Goodness only knows how tough it would have been in, down and back out. And then having to bring all that you've dug out back out along those tunnels, up through here, back out the entrance and up to the surface. The effort they went to, let alone the risks they were taking, just goes to show how valuable a commodity this was for them. Tin miners earned a decent wage compared to other local industries. With other jobs scarce and families to feed, Cornwall's men were prepared to put their lives in danger for their work. Conditions in this coastline's tin mines were hot and oppressive. Particles of mica dust in the air caused lung disease, and many men lost their lives chasing new seams of tin. The method they used to check the stability of the tunnels was literally this. And listening out for a good sharp ring off the bar, that meant that the rock here was solid. But if you got a duller sound, that was an indication that the rock was a bit softer. Mine collapses were a constant threat. In the 20th century, technological advances helped safety, but there were still terrible risks. This deep Levant mine shaft I'm descending housed a large lift cage to get the men in and out of the mine. Today the lift has gone, and the only way in is by ladder. It's best not to look down into the abyss below. How deep are we here? We're only about uh, 20, 25 metres below surface here. But how it keeps on going, doesn't it? How, oh, geez, how far down does it go? It goes get? down about 550 metres. Took about half an hour from the top to the bottom of here on, on this particular type of lift. In 1919, the connections at the top of the lift broke. Miners fell to their deaths or were crushed by the falling lift. 31 men were killed in, in this shaft and another 19 seriously injured. One survivor says it was as if the gates of hell had opened and fire and brimstone were pouring down on me. Oh, my goodness. But as long as there were profits to be made, the production wheels kept turning. In 1985, the price of tin crashed from £10,000 to £3,400 per tonne. Production gradually slowed down, and in 1998, the last tin mine closed. A whole underground world fell silent. Its secrets awaiting discovery. discovery.